Good morning. It's a little, little later than we want to start, but it's Mike Mutzel and Deanna Mutzel. We're going to answer your questions and talk about vegetables on a ketogenic diet. Mm -hmm. So before we got cut off and the stream stopped mm -hmm. last time, what I was trying to say is I was uh, messaged an Instagram uh, screenshot of a, a popular ketogenic forum. Mm -hmm. And this individual uh, was sharing with me what a, um, you know, kind of a pundit, a guru in the space was saying. He was basically saying that, you know, on a ketogenic diet, you don't need vegetables. And she was like, what do you think about this comment? And I, you know, my response was like, well, if you're planning on only living for three, six months, then sure, like you don't need vegetables physiologically to get into ketosis. You can just do it with fat and fasting and protein, you know, no fruit, no vegetables. But if you want to live past 45, 50, you might want to have some vegetables. Would you agree? Yeah. So, the, you know, ketosis <laughs> is really, as, as all of you who watch this channel, you know, you're, you're commenting, you're here. Um, yeah, so someone's talking about fruit. Someone says, hey, good morning. Hello from, from uh, finally you. reloaded and we're on. Yeah, Yay. Stephanie, thank you. Yeah, there were some issues <sighs> with uh, the Black Magic Converter. Oh my gosh. Um, so yeah, it's important. So uh, question, why keto over paleo? Is it to save money? Yeah, that's Matt, that's a really good question. And, mm -hmm. and what, that's what I wanted to address here. So obviously, you know, before you start on any way of eating or really anything in life, if you, I'm reading this book, Perennial uh, Seller by Ryan Holiday, and he talks about, you know, a lot of creative people uh, when they go to make something, uh, they don't really know who their avatar is, who their, who their desired customer is, right? So, you know, you need to have like, you know, if you're pointing an arrow, you need to know where you're pointing, right? Mm -hmm. So when it comes to eating, what are you eating for, right? Are you eating for pleasure? Uh, are you eating to lose weight, burn fat, to build muscle, to, you know, our daughters up and stuff like that. Chickens in the background. <laughs> so we need to know what our goals are. Now, some great uh, applications of nutritional ketosis are if you have had head trauma, anxiety, you have epilepsy, you have seizures, things like that. Mm -hmm. You're in a high impact sport like football or you know soccer. Um, maybe your occupation is such where you're you know, a race car driver, whatever it may be. Like you can really enhance the resilience of your brain and protect your brain b being in nutritional ketosis. Do you have a strong family history of insulin resistance, diabetes, high blood pressure? These are all applications, right? Mm -hmm. So. If, if that's your goal is to prevent and ameliorate those diseases and so forth, then nutritional ketosis makes sense, right? Um, then we also need to think about other, um, you know, health benefits um, of different parts of the body, you know, that your diet would impact, like, you know, having a high diverse array of, back, of, of vegetables, of polyphenols, of fibers, because that, that will enhance biodiversity, mm -hmm. and that can affect insulin sensitivity, fat burning, athleticism, and all that. So that being said, it makes sense that if you want to live again past 45, 50 and want to avoid chronic age-related diseases like cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and mild cognitive impairment, brain loss, you probably want to have, ke have ketosis and have high vet show diversity. And that a backfire too, right, Mike? I mean, wouldn't your, your gut like backfire everything if it's inflamed? It's going to take you out of fat burning, which is going to take you out of... Ketosis. Exactly. Exactly. So it's like short term. Short term. You know? So if you want long term ketogenic benefits, totally add your veggies. Don't yeah. Your so focus yeah. on dietary diversity. So that's the theme. Like if you look at you know our Keto Lean Master Class, that's what we teach. That's the whole goal of like everything that we do is is to try to help you have more about chill diversity um, and dietary diversity. So if you guys uh, like that notion, if you're if you're big on bacterial diversity or dietary diversity, please hit that like button right there, that thumbs up that tells us that uh, you're on the same page. Right. Um, so, okay, everyone, hello from Ventura, California. Hello from Malaysia, that's so cool. Um, okay, so let's go back. I think there's a couple questions. Finally, we're here, yeah. Uh, Sandra says, British guy talking in the background. Um, the Gut Gardener says, what, uh, what do you feel is a good ketone body level to truly stay in ketosis? So that, um, you know, the consensus is really around like 0.8 millimolar and higher for, for kind of nutritional ketosis. But some people, you know, it really depends the context of glucose and ketones together. So you need to get, you know, we help, if you want to learn more about the specifics, we talk about it, click the link here in our Keto Lean Masterclass. But measuring your glucose and your ketones together, that gives you the full story. Mm -hmm. And it's going to change throughout the day, how long you fasted, if you've recently exercised, how stressed you are, and all that. So that's, that's kind of, you know, what it, what it comes down to is um, you want to look at them together. And there's a, you know, glucose to ketone index, TKI, um, that can help you to understand that. So that's the thing there is, you know, I've talked to Dr. Dominic D'Agostino about this and so forth. Some people are really good utilizers of ketones, others aren't. 
you know, yeah. so so sometimes we you see people on social media bragging about how high their beta hydroxybutyrate is. That may mean that they're not a good utilizer of mm -hmm. the ketones. For example, I haven't met anyone that brags about how high their glucose is. I don't know, <laughs> right? Well, ketones are energy just like glucose is. Obviously, yeah, there's the propensity to, they're a cleaner substrate, cleaner energy substrate, but mm -hmm. they're an energy molecule nonetheless. Can you explain why that would be though? I mean, I why you'd have really high ketones? Well, why would it be bad to have the high ketones? Like, just explain that whole process. I just find yeah, it very it, interesting. It may mean that you're not utilizing the ketones, essentially. Right. Or if you're coming back from like sprinting and so forth, you may, your ketones may be higher because the whole energy. Yeah, it could be more like endurance training and things like that. So your body's actually like rapidly, you know, freeing up stored adipose tissue, converting that into, you know, free right. fatty acids, and then sending those free fatty acids, you know, kind of into the mitochondria to, to build up that acetyl-CoA pool. So no matter so if you're eating glucose or ketone, you know, fat for fuel, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, it's still going to build up that acetyl-CoA pool. Right. And, uh, and it just happens that, you know, when you, you know, in ketosis and you're burning fats for fuel, you're taking, you know, that acetyl CoA, running it through the mitochondria and not fermenting it via glycolysis. Okay. Did you mention like what time of day is best to test them? And yeah. It's, so it's good. I think like before a meal, after a meal, yeah. I think that's, that's really okay. good. Um, first thing in the morning before you go to bed, like it's there, you know, you can test them whenever you want really. Not necessarily after exercise though. No, exercise would be good. It depends on the type of exercise. But yeah, it can, it can give you an insight into, learning, you know, yeah. how fat adapted you are and stuff like that. Hey, hey, Julio. Hello there. Um, how's the keto for your kids going? It's going really well, Joe. Yeah. Um, yeah. She's not like full on keto all the time, but no, she's definitely a low carb low kid. Low carb kid. Yeah. Just eating real food. Getting enough protein. Yeah. 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 Good eggs and things like that. Vegetables, um, getting her veggies. Okay, pain in the lower left side of the rib cage while IF and keto. Any idea why that could be? Mm. You know, anytime you have weird pain and things like that, I would definitely see a healthcare practitioner to, to rule that out. Mm. Um, so lower left rib could be pancreatic, could be kidney, could be a million. Yeah, it's uh, not a not a physician. So uh, you definitely need to go see a doctor. Right. Yeah. What about this one here with vegetables about um, the AIP intolerance? Basically, yeah. you can only eat cucumbers and spinach. Yeah, that's not a good long-term solution, to be totally honest with you. I mean, I understand, you know, like short-term dietary restrictions, but if you look at uh, unindustrialized humans throughout the world, you know, they're having a very diverse array of vegetables. So what I would recommend, this was Matt, I believe, Matt White, yeah. go back into the highintensityhealth.com, search in uh, the search bar, dietary diversity, and you'll pull up podcasts from Lauren Cordain, who is the founder and kind of modern day pioneer of the whole paleo diet movement. He talks about uh, Western Plain Indians and how the children eat over 90 grams of fiber per day wow. and a really diverse array of different fibers. Also, you want to check out the interview with Jeff Leach. So he's studied folks in Tanzania and other parts of the world, and these children are all eating a lot of tubers, a lot of different fibers. So um, this idea that we need to go on a long-term restriction of fermentable, of non-fermentable, like a low FODMAP diet, mm -hmm. um, short-term, that, that's good. Long, it wasn't... It wasn't um, it, it, too much fiber, too many good things in the diet that caused your inability to tolerate that. Mm -hmm. it, what it really is, is uh, most oftentimes is a lack of bacterial diversity mm -hmm. that can cause an aberrant overgrowth of certain bacteria. So I think the, the end game here is to get our bodies more metabolically flexible and to be able to tolerate and digest and handle a diverse array of, of vegetables, phytonutrients, things like that. So if you agree with that, hit that like button. That's what we're all about. So Matt, that's what I would suggest is um, long-term, you know, it can't just be lamb and rice or cucumbers and, and whatever. So mm -hmm. we want to get to the point where we can handle these things and it might take time. Mm -hmm. Introduce slowly over time, uh, chew your food mindfully. And set, let's say, for example, just spinach and cucumber, if that's all you can tolerate, right? change the way that you cook those foods. Sometimes have them raw, sometimes steam, sometimes roast, What's sometimes pan fry. Yeah. So you're getting and activating different enzymes and uh, nutrients. What about uh, thoughts on one meal a day? Yeah, I see that from Bushuki, mm -hmm. I think. Um, I think it just depends on, on uh, how much exercise you're getting. So many different factors. Yeah, what are your thoughts on one meal a day? Yes, yeah, I think that, that works. You know, it works for some people, um, but you know, it totally depends. A few things you wanna look at, how's your sleep? 
most importantly, how's your digestion? Mm -hmm. The thing is, I've noticed like when you really start compressing that feeding window, like we talk about, and that's a great way yeah. to get into ketosis, to kind of shut down insulin, mm -hmm. um, it can affect your bowel movements. Yeah. Right? A little constipation. A little constipation. Yeah. And remember, your gut is like a big, <laughs> that's where your hormones are detoxed and excreted, and of course, disrupting chemicals, things yeah. in your diet, heavy metals. Like, you don't want to, like, all, all that, those things that your body's trying to eliminate, you don't want to recirculate that. Like, maybe once in a while, we, when we travel, um, typically we'll just have one meal a day if we're traveling all day, um, right? Yeah. And that's all you really need. It just depends on your activity. But you're if you're doing. lifting weights, doing CrossFit, yeah. bodybuilding, you definitely need to eat more. Yeah. So, Definitely. so just, it totally depends just cause the guru eats w once a day. I know yeah, everyone's different. Everyone's different. So just gotta play around with it. Give that a try. Um, uh, there he says, there's a jow. Okay. Sound, yeah. sound is low. Someone says sound is low. Do you use intermittent fasting as a lifestyle? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Time restricted feeding. I like to call it just a window so that you make sure your gut's getting enough of a break and your insulin is nice and stable. So, um, we try to do between, I don't know, I do between two and seven, realistically, where my eating, eating window. Eating between two and seven. Between two and seven, but it varies. Sometimes I start at one, sometimes I finish at 8.30, just for social reasons, so. Um, but generally my goal is around like seven hours, and I find that I'm my leanest and fittest, and I have the highest energy while I am doing that, so, yeah. That's awesome, I think it's a great lifestyle strategy. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, you know, especially for peri post uh, menopausal women and, and women going through menopause, I just recorded an awesome segment. I'm going to put in the Keto Lean Masterclass group, uh, kind of a video docu series uh, with Dr. Robin Walsh in uh, Waterloo, Ontario. One strategy that she recommends is having people starting to fast on Sunday night, not eat again until dinner on Monday. Oh, wow. Have a normal feeding day, like two to three meals, whatever, Tuesday. And then again, go 24 hours. So, so basically three 24 hour fasts per week. Yeah. And she found, she finds that that's really easy for people to you know, stick to that, you know, the, the, um, you know, kind of the compliance and people can adhere to that program without mm -hmm. making a sh huge lifestyle shifts. Right. You know, the, whatever it is, you know, if you're intermittent fasting, time restricted feeding, whatever that is, just try to be a little consistent with it, you mm -hmm. know? So sometimes you see people fast and then they have six meals a day and then one meal is all over the place. So, right. Like, if you go back and listen, last October, Alessandro Freddy and I did an awesome podcast all about uh, time restricted feeding. And so, when we think about sunlight and artificial light at night and all these different things, these are ways to entrain our body's circadian clock. But eating is a way to entrain and retrain your body's circadian rhythms as well. Mm -hmm. So, if you're totally all over the place and bouncing around, guess what? Your circadian rhythms are going to be screwed up. So, then yeah. you hear people like there's a question that just came up. I think it was. Uh, uh, do, do, do John C says, you know, he's talking about uh, he's got, gonna have a baby and stuff like that. So wants to go on keto and and ha maybe have sleep deprivation issues. And yeah. you know, some people do say, oh, I tried keto, but then I couldn't sleep. So I wonder how much of that is that their circadian clock is screwed up yeah. from eating meals all over the place. Um, so if you guys right. agree with that, please hit that like button. That tells us that uh, we're on the same wavelength. Okay. I'd also recommend to just throw something in there if you're new to. Um, intermittent fasting and time restricted feeding or just like fasting for a period of time in general um, to break your fast with something easy on the gut um, I found it helped me because sometimes I would start with like a bolus meal and it would just it wouldn't feel good it would actually cause like the constipation and so forth so if you kind of break it with like maybe a green like real food obviously not like a quest bar or something like that which we'll get to but um, just real food like a green smoothie low sugar low carb um, that's what I highly recommend doing that. It'll make the process a lot easier. And then maybe like three and a half hours later, having more of a, like a legit meal. Yeah. So, do you agree with that? Yeah. No, I think that's, I, I definitely agree. Or so Steve maybe Mitch. just like, it can even be a piece of fruit. So, yeah. You know, that's the thing. You so know, I was trying to play meal. that segment yeah. uh, with Dr. Tommy Wood on this. Um, people are saying the audio is low. Let me see if I can crank that audio up here. Um, testing, testing, one, two, three. All right, this should be a little bit louder. So some folks were saying, uh, oh, sorry, I was trying to play the segment with Dr. Tommy Wood. Um, so don't be scared about berries and polyphenols and fruits. So that could be something like real easy, you know, berries and, and raspberries, blueberries, things like that, goji berries, whatever it may be, mm -hmm. um, can be digested very quickly. They have polyphenols. It's good to minimize endotoxin absorption and so forth. So uh, let's see here. So uh, John C. says, you know, what about uh, ketosis? Um, 
with the new baby coming. Uh, brilliant. So, yeah. you know, as we've learned so much from Dr. Dom D'Agostino, and I have an interview with him coming up, and he's going to be part of our movie series, is, you know, the ketogenic diet really helps the body, especially the brain, function better under environmental extremes. So whether it's, you know, super high levels of oxygen in Navy SEALs, uh, when they're diving underwater with the oxygen rebreather, things like that, like environmental extremes. And so one you know, kind of modern day environmental extreme would be having a baby, right? New because, parent, yeah. we're, you know, new parent, it's <laughs> tough. We've been through it. We have a five year old. We get it. Like lack of sleep, stress. You're still working. You're expected to work and produce and all this. You have this mm -hmm. new being. And sometimes it's, you know, they don't understand what you're saying to them because they're crying and, you know, so that can be stressful. So, what better, you know, situation condition to apply a dietary therapy that can help you mitigate that right. and crank up your heart rate variability? So, so John, and here's the other thing: when you miss out on sleep, guess what that does? Your blood sugar cranks it, throws it off. Yeah. So you're gonna, you know, and so one way, uh, one strategy to help even out your blood sugar is to, you know, kind of slam down that, that insulin is a low carb ketogenic style diet with right. some element of time restricted feeding. Mm -hmm. So, John, you're thinking along the same page. Page uh, Jacob says, what are some good ketone readers? There's a lot. Precision Extra is good. There's a lot of them. And there's new ones coming out in the market. So uh, personal trainer Scott says, uh, this new diet has not been used for a long time. My diet is best. Rock on, man. You're, you are you're the man. You should. Whatever works for you, yeah. Scott. Uh, actually, but this diet has been used since the 1920s in epileptic children and has been a clinical study for a very long time. But it's not, it's not a diet, though. It's a way of uh, life. It's a way of life. It's a way and of if, life. Honestly, if you're eating like real food and seasonal and local, if when possible, you're going to be naturally in and out of ketosis. So that's pretty darn real to me. What do you yeah. think? Not yeah. a diet. No, this is not this yeah. is not just some fad diet. That's yeah. not at all what we're talking about. We're talking about a like way of life. Health. That's yeah. why in our Keto Lean Masterclass, we focus on gut health, we focus on sleep, yeah. uh, the temperature of your house, you know, oh, you know stress, so many factors. meditation, all these things really, really have a, a major impact not on just food. Yeah. Okay, so Stephanie says, uh, have you found that a thickening effect on hair regrowth in this way? No. Uh, have not uh, actually a thinning slightly yeah. periodically I, and that could just be age genetics whatever it may be you're so old Mike I know I'm gonna be 35 in a few Ooh. weeks um, so <laughs> starting with a certain supplement what I would suggest Stephanie if, if you have hair uh, loss or accelerated hair loss a few things we obviously have hormones so your hormones can be affected by the foods that you eat especially mm -hmm. this is so so true for both men and women and you can get higher levels of you know insulin is uh, a factor involved in accelerated hair loss and uh, if you're insulin resistant you can get things like pcos which can lead to elevated levels of androgens mm -hmm. uh, in women which can obviously accelerate hair loss and you can get you know male pattern baldness as a, a female so uh, go back and if, if you're having hair loss issues Definitely, you want to get on something like myelinositol, which yep. I do have here. This one of my favorite, favorite uh, all-time supplements. Oh, I have the focus locked. I forgot. Ah. Uh, Relax Max by Zymogen. <laughs> Why? Because it has myelinositol, L-theanine, taurine, GABA, magnesium. This is a really, really good, good adjunct stuff. to a low-carb ketogenic style diet. Tastes good, too. Because it will fetch your blood sugar in a positive way. Okay, so Christopher says, watching a conversation between... Uh, ooh, I lost it. Uh-oh. Sorry, this the questions are okay. Uh, what's up with this thing? Mm. All right, going back to the questions. Okay, um, there's a lot of questions here, guys. Thanks for being here. Uh, oh, thank you, Stephanie. My shirt, Lululemon. Lulu. Lulu. Okay. Um, where'd it go? I'm trying to find that question. Okay, uh, I'm trying to go back. Trying to go back. To, okay, can you do a? So Sydney says, uh, can a can a ketogenic diet? Uh, give you fatty liver. No, it's going to do the opposite. Actually, what causes uh, lipid deposition within the liver is you know, a process known as de novo lipogenesis from carbohydrates and insulin resistance. So now that being said, there's other causes of fatty liver. For example, if you have sepsis or low grade sepsis, we talk about this on the channel a lot, metabolic endotoxemia, where you're eating crappy foods and not enough polyphenols, not enough fiber, you can leak in you know, gram negative bacteria that can cause this first hit on the liver and cause damage on the liver. So mm -hmm. I would say an, an unhealthily designed low carb, high fat diet can certainly cause issues on the liver. Why? Because of this poor gut health, loss of bacterial diversity, increase in you know, permeability in the gut. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. There's one question here about counting calories. Um, no, I don't think it's necessary. This is my opinion to count calories. 
especially if you're doing the time-restricted feeding. You just have to really focus on intuitive eating. Um, you may need to count calories if your hormones are out of whack. Um, just to no, kind of know. No, don't, don't, don't go down that road. Well, I just what, don't no, recommend. What, I mean, just, I mean, that's like me with, with like counting ketones, right? Like I don't measure anything. I just really try to be like intuitive, but, um, just getting an idea, right? I mean, this is just my opinion as a woman and my, from my past experiences <clears throat> where like I used to count calories, um, didn't work, kind of backfired, uh, really tried to focus on hunger and intuitive eating and that's been the healthiest way to eat because sometimes like people will try to do like low calorie and then they'll put on weight and then someone eating like say 4,000 calories a day will be like super lean so I don't think really it's a good or it can go the measure. opposite where people think like oh you know my uh, basal metabolic rate is is x it's 2200 whatever 2600 calories and I've, yeah. I've only eaten oh, 1800 right, calories right. so I can afford to ha even though I'm not hungry even though I was pretty inactive today oh, even yeah. though I feel full like my basal metabolic rate is 2600 like that's how many calories I burn so I have to eat another 800 calories right, right? yeah it's so macros. so that's the issue yeah. so what Deanna was kind of saying I think it's better how I got into this back in 2002 a bodybuilding friend of mine said look like if you want to cut weight you know, and stuff like this. He was a you know competitor, NPC, Northern California like bodybuilding group, and stuff like that. We, we tracked down everything that we ate, but we didn't track down the macros. Okay. So it was like you know three egg yolks, twelve you know egg whites, mm -hmm. half a cup of oatmeal, you know two tablespoons of almond butter. Like tracking that, and then seeing how your progress rent went, and correlating. This was like on a composition notebook. Again, we teach you guys all this in the Keto Lean Masterclass exactly mm -hmm. how to do this. So I think it's good to track what you're eating, but to drill down on every little nuance and detail, yeah. it, it can become obsessive and right. lead to, you know, disproportional emotional eating. And it's just that, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it. Again, I did the uh, macro counting and it was just like that. Like I look at the end of the day and sometimes I'd be stressed out because I'm like, well, I've only got five grams of carbs left to eat, you know? And so I would avoid like purple onions and really good things that are good for my gut. So yeah. I would not recommend that. Definitely. But getting an overall view, like just tracking your finances, like just what you monitor, you can improve upon. Right? So, so have a general idea upon like, you know, about where things are going, what right. you're eating, writing down the quantity of food yeah. from just a gross like macro level, mm -hmm. not macronutrient level, but just big picture level. And then seeing where the trends are. We're like, wow, I really you know, had the snack here and it overate here and this is how it made me feel. Yeah, so that you right. get the feedback that way. Right. Um, but Christopher has a really good question. He says, conversation between Dr. Brian and Chatterjee, who we caught up with in May. You guys are gonna get access to that very, very soon. And Chris Kresser, it seems that they both agree that keto is helpful for a medical condition. Mm -hmm. um, but transitioning to a whole food diet after is great. So, you know, Dr. Ch Chatterjee and I talked all about this. You know, we got, got two interviews coming, you know, with him. Um, you know, we went out to dinner, all this sort of stuff. So. A whole food diet can be a ketogenic diet too, right? So it really depends on why are you going keto in the first place, how mm -hmm. I introduce this. You need to know why are you doing this? Are you doing this because it's popular or do you have traumatic brain injury, early mild cognitive impairment, um, fatty liver, insulin resistance, obesity, you know, strong family history of cancer, stuff like that, right? Or do you want to maintain, make sure you don't gain weight with age and slow down the aging process? Mm -hmm. Then, then that's the keto. That's why you should be on a ketogenic diet. Now, you can eat a, whole, a real foods diet and just add some element of time restricted feeding. It doesn't have doesn't have to be totally low carb, and you can still be in mild nutritional ketosis, right? So there's mm -hmm. so many ways to do it. It's not like you're either keto or you eat a real food diet. Right. They're they're one and the same. Yeah. yeah. And, and then adding exercise is not a huge. Adding exercise, that's you're in ketosis naturally. Factor, that's actually. that's a big factor. Wouldn't huge. You agree? A lot of movement. We track our steps. Yeah, we do. Um, so hopefully that helps. It's not it's not mutually exclusive. Like mutually exclusive. It's not like real food diets here and keto's over here. They're they're the same. They can be the same. Right. Um, it's just the thing is a lot of we we kind of can be a little bit too obsessive about it. And people think a ketogenic diet is having MCT oil all the time and exogenous ketones and, and there's more, much more to the story. I don't want to call it a diet anymore, Mike. Let's just Sick stop that. that. Let's Man, just stop calling it ketogenic diet. Let's let's call it for the books ketogenic lifestyle. So Becca says explain net carbs versus total carbs when eating vegetables. Yeah, so the thing is just you want to count starchy carbs or I wouldn't say count. Uh, be aware of the starchy carbs right. and it has to match your activity level. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. Okay? 
so we know that carbs can affect insulin. They can affect you know, body fat. They can affect a million different things. But carbs can also be used for energy based upon if you're doing glycolytic activity like CrossFit, like bodybuilding, like mm-hmm. sprinting, you know, or very long distance events where you might need a little, you know, there's some element of intervals in there. You want carbohydrates. So right. that's the thing. Sweet potatoes, you, squashes. Sweet potatoes, squashes. Yeah. Acorn squash, butternut squash, we apples, fruit. I don't really notice that we have a ton of that. We're really focusing now on dark leafy greens, the veggies above the ground, and then such things like carrots and beets and root vegetables, um, not including ginger and turmeric. Um, we'll just like sprinkle in there to give it some color. You don't need a ton of like the beets and the carrots to get the benefits. Right. So. Yeah. Um, Does that make sense? So yeah. the thing is, Becca, you want to move away from that paradigm of even thinking like net carbs anyway and counting carbs. Especially with vegetables. You, you yeah. need to think mm-hmm. about your intuition, mm-hmm. how you feel, how's your digestion, how's your motility, how do your pants feel in your body. Move away from counting all that stuff. It's right. it's not sustainable. It's going to lead to you know emo, you know dysfunctional eating behaviors and patterns, obsessiveness. You don't want to do that. It, right. It's that's not that's not sustainable long term. Uh, unless, of course, you're a paid athlete or a bodybuilder, um, then sure, you're stepping on stage and count them. Right. Okay, so can a ketogenic diet give you fatty liver? We already addressed that. Um, do you ever count calories? Nope. And I, we don't recommend them, as you've been hearing. Uh, depends on a person, usually fat and protein keeps most people uh, satiated. Yeah, but, but also fiber can keep you satiated. Water can make you feel full. Right. So, so there's a million things. Uh, Mindful eating can make mm-hmm. you feel satiated. Mm-hmm. So, so that's the thing. Well, that's a, that's that's everything. Chewing your food? Are you kidding me? Okay, so Joel says Gosh. I can hear you fine. Thanks, Joel. Um, that's huge. Okay, uh, can can we get enough protein, amino acids from a raw food diet? Love it. This is for you. We love raw food. Can you get enough protein? Yeah, I believe so. Um, you did a podcast with um, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon mm-hmm. that I really really enjoyed talking about leucine and getting it from animal meat. But I have to say, like, we've decreased our animal protein. We've been really focusing on, like, sprouting and soaked nuts and seeds. And um, we've been eating raw food for, like, what, since I've known you. Yeah. You know, for um, years. But, yeah. yeah, I think you can get enough protein. But I'll let you know in a month if I've, de- I've lost muscle mass from eating less animal meat. Like, literally, like, once a week. Yeah. I'm having that. I think so. this is a really, really important question and yeah. one that uh, we're going to revisit a lot. And I want to interview mm-hmm. people and talk about it. And we're doing a lot of you know, trial and error and testing, you know, on ourselves to Currently. try and figure this out. Yeah. Um, so, you know, long story short, you know, we, we tend to think that eating chicken that's never seen the sun, that these chickens are stepping on their own feces and given antibiotics and genetically modified corn, you know, just because it yields a certain amount of protein that that, you know, is going to help us in some way, shape or form. But, right. you know, I think it makes a lot more sense to have organic sprouted nuts and seeds over that type of protein right you know, if you, possible too. you know local farm fresh eggs a mm-hmm. periodic game meat or wild caught you know fish things like that are, are are where we can get high quality amino acids and high quality fats because the pro i wouldn't even count protein from you know the factory right these these yeah. factories where you know, the, the protein delivery sources that are bringing us these products, you know, these, these food-like products, you know, from the like CAFOs and, and stuff like that. So, I, you know, I don't even consider that yeah. something that you should even eat, right. you know. So uh, what we do, uh, what we have done, and we may not do it this year, is buy a local grass-fed cow, and that's our protein source. And we eat meat very sparingly. Yeah. We have 19 chickens. We eat a lot of eggs, raw, scrambled, yeah. hard-boiled. Yeah. We change it up. Um, and so I think that's where protein should, your protein should come right. from. And then we supplement with things like grass-fed whey protein, mm-hmm. uh, Zymobolics from Zymogen, which is a really, really cool branch chain amino acid product. So mm-hmm. we're s- now more than ever, you can eat a low animal protein diet and supplement with those uh, amino acids that are not found in that. In right. That. And raw when possible too, nutrient dense. Yeah. So um, definitely we try to do raw when possible. So, uh, Hall, if you want to learn how to kind of cook this way, click the link here because we talk about this all in our course a lot. Deanna mm-hmm. actually um, has some amazing, like, high mm-hmm. ve- vegan protein. We're not talking, like, grains here. We're talking sprouted, soaked, fermented um, seeds and things like that in ve- breads that are high fat, low carb. Right. Teach you how to do that. So, someone comes on and says, hey, guys, love your show. Currently living in Cairo, uh, Egypt. You're a CrossFitter doing keto. Wow. Mm-hmm. How many carbs do you recommend and when? So, I you, again... Get, get away from that how many carbs. It's based on your performance. Mm-hmm. How much body fat do you have? Why are you doing keto in the first place? Are you trying to lose weight? Do you have mm-hmm. diabetes, et cetera? So eat however many carbs will help you perform so that you have that extra 
rep. You have something left in the tank, you know. So CrossFitters, are de it's definitely not a ketogenic friendly sport. You can be mostly keto, but you're going to have to supplement with carbohydrates if you want your performance to be optimal under CrossFitting right. style conditions. Why? Because it's a mix of glycolytic and aerobic work under time uh, constraints. So that's not, there's simply not, a, keto can do really well, you can keto adapt and still utilize pyruvate dehydrogenase and all that, but you're gonna have to have carbohydrates. Um, Resistant starches. Not a fan of the high mm. carb intake. So yeah, it just depends on your workouts. On days where it's like, a, you know, you're doing a lot of wads that are really, you know, short in rest, then you're gonna have more carbs. Okay, Christopher says, do you guys incorporate resistant starches at all? Yeah from vegetables in our garden, yeah. uh, not supplementing. I mean, sure, you can supplement with resistant potato starch and all this sort of stuff, but mm -hmm. you know, that's, do yeah. people in Tanzania and our ancestors <laughs> that don't have diabetes and obesity, do they like buy resistant starch? Right. No. You can get it from green bananas too. I mean. Fermented foods, yeah. green bananas. If I'm using uh, bananas, which is rare, um, if they're, when they're in green, season. if I'm making like banana bread, I'll use green bananas. It's actually really good. Yeah, so, um, yeah, but we do use cooked and, and uh, all types of different colored potatoes, yeah. different colored squashes where you can get these starches from. So I think mm -hmm. that's good. Um, Relax Max have, has been an evening game changer. Uh, Christopher, love hearing that. Yeah. That's cool. I want to talk to you more about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Jacob says, what do you think of a green veggie and avocado apple drink? Uh, love that, apple cider, etc. to get into ketosis fast. Yeah, um, so Jacob, one fast way to get into ketosis without like all these supplements and drinks and all that is fasting and exercise. But obviously, uh, a bolus of fat can do that. Uh, yeah. You know, that can be helped with caffeine. So these are some of the ways to get in there. Like fasted cardio every morning. Can dogs do keto? Yeah, um, <laughs> there is. Let's see. Um, the, the Keto Foundation has some. Uh, oh, sorry, the Epigenics Foundation has like a, a dog sanctuary where um, dogs with cancer can go on a ketogenic diet. That's Our so dogs cool. have been very low carb, so yeah. we give them chicken necks, chicken liver, beef heart, lamb heart, eggs, and then leftovers from the garden. It's kind of cruel that we give them chicken necks too because our chickens are watching while we're doing it. It's so know. sad. We but, love our furry kids. But yeah. those chicken necks, at least the whole chick, I mean, those chickens are going to be killed anyway, you know, yeah. right? And so at least not ours. they're not ours, right? But at the store, <laughs> we're getting these. They're from supposedly happy chickens. We don't really know. Right. But Dogs do need a lot more protein than, than humans do. Okay, so uh, XGMX says, um, is one meal a day at the evening? How do you handle social interactions, especially with eating? Yeah. This is tough. It, it, we surround ourselves with like-minded people. You know, our, our close friends are right on board with us regarding like, especially with what we eat, not so much like intermittent fasting, but we schedule our dinners around five o'clock so that we're eating early. Yeah. That's just how we do it and they understand and they prefer it too. Yeah, right. a lot of friends do like that. So, yep. yeah, I mean, you are the sum of the five people that you spend the most time with, right? So if a lot of yeah. your friends are eating a bunch of shitty food, you need to make new friends. I'm right. sorry, but that's just reality of the situation. Or convince them to eat real food, which is... Yeah, or like have the dinner parties at your house so right. that you can control the food. That's right. another thing that you can do if people are not on the same page. Yeah. But if you're in a restaurant situation and social work situation and you can't control everything, just obviously ditch the bread, ditch the rice, you know, ask for extra butter, extra avocado. That, yeah. That's like a really easy thing yeah. to do. And we're gonna do kind of a, a more of a vlog style video to talk more about that. Right. Um, love your shirt, Deanna, so pretty. Yeah, I saw that okay, have to be Very careful nice. with pancreatitis. Yes, uh, Joel, if you have pancreatitis, you, you might need to be careful. Why? Because pancreatic lipase, and there's different enzymes released from the pancreas that you're going to need to be making high quantities of to help digest your fats. So, hello from Paddock. Padaka, I don't know where that is. Audio is good, awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, let's see. Uh, cancer, usually lots of malignant, okay. Um, can mix sugar and fat. Um, hmm, we don't recommend you really eating a lot of sugar. But uh, hello from North Korea. <laughs> That's gotta be a joke. <laughs> uh, <wh> <laughs> They're crying. <laughs> Why do I do? <laughs> yeah, oh my gosh. North Korea, hope you're hidden well. Yeah, that's pretty, that's funny too. Uh, uh, how, how, when I do carbs, uh, I try to stick with fresh berries. Love it. Mm -hmm. um, easy to do now since huckleberry season. Yes, huckleberry season, elderberry season, elderberry. blueberry season. We love berries, so we're on the yeah. same page. Enjoy fruits and vegetables. Yes. And you don't need a ton of it either. We just had like you know, a tiny little handful. Yep, 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 yep. yep. Where do you get kitchen um, readers? Amazon or eBay? Um, could I eat potatoes every day? Well, it depends on how active you are and how insensitive you are. Matt White says, I would assume that in order to fast, uh, you should do solid blood work with ability, adrenals, etc. Um, 
You know, I, I would actually say that's not necessarily true. Humans have been fasting for forever, right? And if you can't fast, then yeah, do the blood work to see what's going on. Like, why are you unable to go without food for an extended period of time? Because humans uh, have naturally lived in an environment where food ebbed and flowed. There was a lot of food and periods of no food. So uh, if you can't do that, something's wrong. Do you have- Feast and famine. Yeah, yeah. is it yep. sleep, is it stress, is it environmental toxins? What is it? Um, or um, just ask what we drink. And we don't, we're not big drinkers, but when we do drink, Mike loves kombucha beer. Kombucha beer, I love it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Seems to make it a little bit better. You know, there's kombucha in it, I guess, but just it's in moderation. Fermented, et cetera. Moderation. Yeah, black cherries. Yes, black okay. cherries. Cool. Yeah. Okay, uh, fit like Frenchie MCT before workout and TV spoons of coconut oil. Um, yeah, do you need MCT oil before workout? It depends on what you're doing. Depends on the type of workout yeah. that you're doing, yeah. Um, if you're hitting the gym for 45 minutes, I don't think so. Um, but if you're like a professional a athlete, elite athlete, on a Endurance. long two-hour, yeah. three-hour, five, six-hour training ride, oh, then, sure, yeah. then maybe. Yeah. Um, but yeah, okay, um, so Jay, something. I have been in ketosis for six weeks. Uh, when I go on holiday, non-keto family, how important is me to stay, uh, yeah, I would say, you wanna keep your momentum. So, so one way to lose momentum and lose you know, confidence in what you're doing and stuff is to just totally fall off the rails. Right. So just try and stay low carb. And you can do that, but just simply not eating as much. You know, not you know, not having the three six meals a day that, right. that most people eat. Just fasting a little bit. And and go to the store. Like when you most stores, you can there's natural food stores pretty much all over the world now, mm -hmm. where you can find ghee, you can find avocados. When people are having, you know, donuts or bread or bagels, just have your have your healthy fat that way. Um, black cherries are great. Yes, uh, yeah, I totally agree. Okay, uh, CNN. Oh, con about. Uh, only con about ketogenic lifestyle is terrible constipation. Yeah. So it really depends on, you know, that's a sign that you're not having enough fiber. Right. So you need to go back to the drawing board and say, okay, I need to have more fiber, more dietary diversity. And that happened to me when I was eating too much fat. I think it's possible to have too much fat, honestly. Um, and it was, it was horrible. So I just reduced it and then I was fine. And then having like a magnesium at night before bedtime really helps. So... What are, your, what are your thoughts? Well, she says she's been having plenty of vegetables and starting keto. So mm -hmm. it, it could also be um, you're having too much fat, you know, too many meals. That's one of the things we talk about in our Keto Lean Master class. Yeah. All about, you know, this idea of ketosis is really compressing how much food you're eating into your and when you're eating it. So it's not like, you know, you're switching from the six meals a day, low carb, high protein to, you know, just replacing protein and carbohydrates with more fat because that can just overburden the gut and it, it takes right. a lot of time to break down and digest fat. Right. So also, uh, Stefan or Sandra, do you have a gallbladder? That can affect issues. Um, so yeah, uh, guys, I think we're, you know, really, really appreciate all these questions, uh, tips on how to improve lactose and dairy intolerance. Uh, thing is just get rid of dairy, all right? Just make oh, yeah. ghee, make ghee butter, get rid of the cheese and all that sort yeah. of stuff. You're not gonna improve your dairy tolerance over time. Um, Okay, uh, one bat, one meal a day, high fiber. Do we have Nezzy? Oh my gosh, Nezzy. Nezzy. Come here, bug. Look this is our daughter. Eggs. She just found some eggs from yeah. the chickens. Who laid them? Ginger and poodle. Ginger oh, and bro. poodle. So we got eggs. That that means uh, that breakfast oh, is coming, God. coming very soon, guys. So I really, 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 really appreciate you coming on. Sorry for the little glitch starting here. Um, we just got breakfast. Well, yeah. Almost. So. So we have like our farm fresh eggs. We're going to go make some we eggs. We have two dozen eggs. Yeah. So, guys, hope you really, really have a good weekend. Thanks for tuning in. We do this every Saturday morning at 8 30. Uh, another question on uh, can you work out, supplement behind you? Yeah. So, that's the Zymogen Relax Max. So, if you become a member, uh, we, you get access to the Zymogen formula. So, click this link here and you can join our private Facebook group, get access to real food, ketogenic, low carb recipes, and access and discounts on, on Zymogen supplements. So friends, I really am grateful that you're here. Thanks for helping us. You know, this channel is supported by you. Uh, the advertisements that we have, the courses that we offer. And uh, definitely follow us on uh, Instagram as well and Real Food Lab. And we give some recipes on Real Food recipes Lab. Recipes on our Instagram stories. Yep, and Metabolic Mike. Yeah. Yay. So have an awesome weekend. Mm -hmm. I got a really cool interview coming up with Dr. Nisha Winters very, very yeah. soon. Uh, isn't whey protein insulinogenic? Yes, it is. So that's why you want to have it post-workout. If you're going to have whey, not every day either. All right, friends, we will catch up with you very, very soon. Catch up with you next week. <laughs>